If you want to play beautiful music, you need to know how to play your instrument so well that it is not an obstacle to fully expressing yourself. To that end, the first thing we have to do is make sure that we have an accurate conception of how our piano playing bodies work. That is what this video is all about. Let's begin by reminding ourselves that our piano playing body includes more than just our fingers. It includes our hands, our forearms, our upper arms, our shoulders, and our torso, and even our head. Believe it or not, even our head. And so what we are going to do is explore both the capabilities and the limitations of each of these piano playing body parts one by one. And then we're going to put it all together to see how they work together in a unified way. As we do so, we are going to remap your body image in at least eight important ways. Have a list. Number one, by experiencing firsthand what desirable, comfortable, natural, and therefore musical postures look like and feel like. Number two, by experiencing firsthand what desirable, comfortable, natural, and therefore musical kinds of motions look like and feel like. Number three, by experiencing firsthand what desirable, comfortable, natural, and therefore musical ranges of motions look like and feel like. Number four, by experiencing which kinds of motions are naturally slow and which are naturally fast. Number five, by becoming aware of and gently eliminating habitual unconscious tension. Whew. Number six, by becoming aware of and gently eliminating wasted effort. Number seven, by becoming aware of and gently eliminating unnecessary motions. And number eight, by experiencing firsthand how all your piano playing body parts work together to make beautiful music. And if you stay with me, you will discover that developing a musical technique is not about doing physical exercises. Ah! No. It's about discovering how to play each musical pattern with a fluid choreography using the natural capabilities that you already possess. Along the way, you're going to discover how making just a few simple adjustments on how you position and move your piano playing body parts will absolutely liberate your technique. And in doing so, you are going to learn how to dance at the keyboard. Let's begin with an exploration of your head and torso by doing five experiments. Experiment number one. Sit down as if to play some imaginary music on an imaginary piano, something fun, and then Sway your head left and right and forward and back, allowing your, your head to rotate freely, right? Don't, don't think about this. Just kind of allow yourself to just, you know, be natural. And notice how all your other piano playing body parts, your torso, arms, hands, and fingers, all naturally go along for the ride. Experiment number two. 
let's get our imaginary music started again. But this time, let's try to sway our head, but without allowing our torso to move at all. So let's try swing left and right and forward and back. And notice that this is virtually impossible. So now let's do the reverse. Let's hold our head absolutely steady, as steady as you can, and see if we can sway our torso left and right and forward and back. And notice that this too is virtually impossible. So now let's just allow them to, to move freely together. Yeah, swing left and right and forward and back rotating freely and notice that your head and torso naturally naturally work together as a flexible and integrated unit experiment number three let's get our imaginary music going again right allowing our torso and head to freely sway forward and back and left and right and rotate you know, just have fun with it. And then suddenly, freeze. And notice all the tension. I can feel this. I can feel it in my neck, down my back, down my arms, into my hands, and even all the way to my fingers. And now unfreeze. And notice how your entire piano playing body feels like it's waking up. Right? Agile and alive and ready for action. Experiment number four. Let's get our imaginary music going again. Allowing your head and torso to sway and rotate freely. And then let's suddenly sit up straight by tensing our lower back muscles. Oh my gosh! It feels awful, doesn't it? Notice how tension just spreads everywhere into your shoulders, arms, hands, and even into your fingers. So what we want to do is allow our head and torso to be naturally supported by our spine without using muscle contractions. So this is not slouching and it's not sitting up straight and rigid, right? It's just allowing your spine to do what it's naturally designed to do, which is to support your torso and head without any effort whatsoever. And so notice as you do this, the feelings of freedom and ease that come to your entire body. Experiment number five. Let's get our imaginary music going again allowing our torso and head to sway and rotate freely. And then let's suddenly pretend that our buns get welded to the piano bench. Oh, and how awful that feels. Again, notice how tension immediately spreads everywhere throughout all our piano playing body parts. And now let's unweld our buns from the bench. Ah, oh, much better. And notice the feelings of freedom and ease that come to our entire piano playing body. And so the takeaway here is this. Your head and your torso work together as a flexible unit, but with a few details. One, your head leads, your spine supports, your buns are not welded to the bench. And when you do this, an amazing thing happens. This provides an extremely stable but agile central core from which all the control and timing of your piano playing emanates and originates. And when you do this, notice the feelings of freedom and ease that accompany all your piano playing 
body parts. Now let's explore how your shoulders work by doing three experiments. Experiment number one. Let's get our imaginary music going with a nice and free and balanced head and torso. And let's notice as we move our arms around how our shoulder naturally rolls forward and back just naturally connecting our torso to our arms without us even having to think about it. Experiment number two. Let's get our imaginary music going again. You know, have, have fun with this. Move your arms around, left and right, up and down, in and out, right? And, you know, notice that our shoulder naturally kind of follows the, our arms around. But this time, let's intentionally prevent our shoulder from doing this rolling motion forward and back. So ready? Playing, playing, playing. Now, freeze. And notice how much tension sets in instantaneously and everywhere. Not just downstream into your arms, but also upstream back into your torso and golly, even into your neck and back muscles. So let's unfreeze our shoulder now, allowing it to roll forward and back. Oh, and notice the feelings of freedom and ease that accompany that release. Experiment number three. Let's get our imaginary music going again with a nice free but balanced head and torso. And let's do something. Let's intentionally in, bleh, intentionally lift our shoulders as we do this. Oh my gosh. And notice all the tension that sets in immediately. Again, not just downstream into your arms, hands, and fingers, but also upstream into your back and your neck. So let's let our shoulders go. And notice, oh the feeling of freedom and ease that comes to all our piano playing body parts. And by the way, it doesn't take much lifting at all. Even the tiniest amount of lift, you can try it. The tiniest amount of lifting will cause this tension to spread everywhere. So when we play, this is extremely important. We have to cultivate the habit of allowing gravity just to let our shoulders drop into their natural position as we play. And so the takeaway here is this. Your shoulders make their maximum contribution to your technique by doing almost nothing. In the first place, all they do is naturally connect your torso to your arms with this forward and backward roll that doesn't require you to really do anything at all, except, you know, get out of your own way. And then secondly, we just allow gravity to have its way with your shoulders, dropping them down into their natural position. Not by pushing them down, and certainly not by lifting, but just allowing gravity to have its way. And so the way your shoulders contribute to your piano technique is almost by doing nothing. By the way, carrying around tension by constraining this rolling motion or by lifting our shoulders may be one of the most common habitual and unconscious tensions that we all carry around with us every day in our everyday activities. So that's the bad news. The good news is we can practice releasing this tension in everything we do. So, for example, we're working on the computer, right? Practice letting your shoulders go. Driving the car. <sighs> Practice letting your shoulders go. Uh, pushing a shopping cart. Practice letting your shoulders go. 
And if you do, you're going to make a major contribution to liberating your entire piano playing mechanism. Now let's explore how your upper arms move by doing four experiments. Experiment number one. Just let your arm dangle from your shoulder and notice that it's capable of three rotations from the shoulder. The first one is like a pendulum that swings forward and back, forward and back. The second rotation is like a pendulum that swings left and right, left and right. And the third rotation from the shoulder, this one's a lot more subtle, is as if your arm is a drill that rotates about its own axis. And notice how in each case, all your body parts downstream, your forearm, hand, and fingers all go along for the ride. Experiment number two. Let's assume our playing posture this time. Right? Balanced head and torso, relaxed shoulders. And, you know, our forearms kind of level with the keyboard. And let's see what happens when we do the forward and back pendulum motion with our upper arm. Th this time, let's just lock our elbows and see what happens. Right? It's like a... It's like a drawbridge. Even though our upper arms are acting like a pendulum, our forearms are acting like a drawbridge. But now this time, let's unfreeze our elbow, and as we move our upper arm, swinging it forward and back, let's allow our forearm to remain level and see what happens. All right? So let's pull it back. In fact, here we, we can see that the angle between our upper arm and our forearms is maybe about 70 degrees now maybe about 90 degrees, right? Now maybe like, uh, I don't know, 120 degrees, somewhere in there. And let's just kind of move things around a little bit until they feel comfortable. And notice that the most comfortable place, if you're like me, the most comfortable angle between your upper arm and your forearm is not 90 degrees, but probably something more like 100 or 110 degrees. All right, and by the way, this is not a rigid position, right? This is just a nominal, comfortable, neutral starting position that allows us to move into the keys, forward, I should say, rather forward into the keys and back away from the keys as needed in order to make things easy to play. Experiment number three. Let's assume our free and easy playing posture Right, balanced head and torso, relaxed shoulders. And let's see what happens to this left and right pendulum motion with our forearms extended out as if to play. And notice that this left and right pendulum motion suddenly becomes something that looks more like flapping your wings. And let's notice a few things, right? Let's lift as if we're about to flap our wings and fly. And then let's pull those wings in as if they're welded to our sides. And notice the feelings of tension that accompany each of these extremes, right? If I lift my arms very high, you can feel that tension just going right into your shoulders and back. And if you pull your elbows to your sides, again, you can feel that tension just shooting everywhere. And so if you're like me, you'll discover that the most comfortable position for this, you know, leaves a little bit of a gap here between your elbow and your sides. And by the way, again, like in every other posture we're going to talk about, none of these positions are rigid and fixed, right? They're just like a nominal and very comfortable neutral starting position that allows us to move freely in both directions as needed to make things easy to play. Experiment number four. Let's assume our playing posture again. Balanced head and torso, relaxed shoulders. And see how this drilling motion 
translates to motion when we raise our forearms as if to play. And notice that this drilling motion from the shoulder now becomes kind of like a windshield wiper motion when we look at what happens with our forearms, hands, and fingers downstream. So all I want to say about this for the moment is that this is not a rotation from the elbow, right? This is a rotation from the shoulder. So just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this later on in the video and see that this is an incredibly important contributor and a very subtle contributor to liberating your technique. Allow me to close out the discussion of your upper arms by declaring emphatically that if you want to play with freedom and ease, you absolutely positively need to allow all three of these upper arm rotations to contribute to each and everything you play at the piano. Now let's explore how your forearms move by doing three experiments. Experiment number one. Let's use everything we've learned so far again, right? Free but balanced head and torso, relaxed shoulders, arms, that are, you know, not welded to your sides and not lifted unnecessarily. And let's explore the two motions that our forearms are capable of. The first motion is like a drawbridge. It's a lifting up and down that rotates from the elbow. And the second motion is a rotation from the elbow Kind of like turning a doorknob or the roll of an airplane. And by the way, notice, as we've been noticing all along, the body parts downstream, in this case, your hand and your fingers, naturally go along for the ride. Experiment number two. Let's take a closer look at the drawbridge motion. Right? And notice when we extend our forearms as if to play, gravity naturally wants to pull our arms down. And that's the bad news. The good news is that this gives us an opportunity to understand three very important principles regarding working with gravity that will absolutely liberate our technique. Principle number one. So that if you stop moving, tension sets in immediately and spreads everywhere. But if you keep moving, you know, even, even in the presence of gravity trying to pull your arms down, if you keep moving, this kind of motion feels quite free and easy. It feels just like you're dancing in space without almost any effort at all. The second principle is that gravity is your friend. And because it's your friend, you don't want to fight it. Three common ways that people fight gravity is by resisting it. Oh, I'm going to resist gravity. Or by collapsing totally. Or by trying to help gravity. By attacking the piano. The third principle is that the proper sensation in your arms should be that of floating. Not resisting gravity and not total collapse, but somewhere in between. In fact, the controlled release of your arm weight between these two extremes of total resistance and total collapse is absolutely essential for controlling and shaping the dynamics of the phrases you play. Experiment number three. Let's take a closer look at the doorknob rotation of our forms. And let's notice something quite interesting. And in that if we try to rotate our forms in the direction that our thumbs are pointed, 
the range of motion is quite limited. But if we try to rotate our forearms in the directions our pinkies are pointed, well, the range of motion is, is quite enormous. In fact, I could turn so much that my palms are pointed at the ceiling. Uh, and by the way, this is made even more difficult and more extreme if we weld our elbows to our sides. So we're rewinding a little bit and you can see another reason why it's very important not to weld your elbows to your sides as you play. Right? Not only does this severely constrain this motion towards your thumbs, but it brings on enormous amounts of tension. The other thing to notice is this. Because of this, the middle of range, the most comfortable orientation for your forearm is not such that the backs of your hands are flat and level, meaning if I had a pencil sticking out of the back of my hand, it would not point to high noon, but it would point to one o'clock, maybe 1.30 in my right hand, and maybe 11 o'clock or 10.30 in my left hand, right? And as always, right, this is not a fixed and rigid position, but just a very comfortable, neutral position from which we can move in both directions in order to play any of our musical patterns with freedom and ease. By the way, if you combine this turning of a doorknob rotation of your forearm with the three rotations in your upper arm that we already talked about, an amazing thing becomes possible. And that is you're able to cover enormous leaps at the keyboard with extreme speed in total balance and with almost no effort whatsoever this is no camera trick now let's explore how your piano playing hands move by doing six Experiments. Experiment number one. Let's assume our playing posture using everything we've learned so far. Right, a balanced but free and flexible head and torso. Relaxed shoulders. Upper arms that are neither unnaturally lifted nor welded to our sides. And forearms such that they're rotated slightly in the direction of our pinkies. And let's notice that our hands are capable of two rotations from the wrist. The first rotation of your hand from the wrist is like the pitch of an airplane, right? Pitch up, pitch down, pitch up, pitch down. And notice, as always, the piano playing parts downstream, in this case your fingers, all go along for the ride. And the second rotation is like the yaw, Y-A-W, yaw of an airplane. All right, so in your right hand, counterclockwise towards your thumb, and then clockwise towards your pinky. In your left hand, it's notice it's a mirror image, right? And as always, in each case, the body parts downstream, in this case, your fingers all go along for the ride. Experiment number two. Let's take a closer look at the pitch rotation of your hand from the wrist and notice that when you make a fist or extend your fingers flat that this motion feels quite difficult right it brings on quite a bit of tension and and slows you down but if you simply allow your fingers to assume their natural curvature 
this motion becomes quite free and easy. Experiment number three. Let's take another look at this pitch rotation of your hand from the wrist. And notice that when we pitch way down or pitch way up, moving your fingers becomes quite difficult at these extreme positions. But the, when the back of your hand is nominally lined up with your forearm, this motion is quite free and easy. And by the way, right, this position is never fixed and rigid, but it's just kind of a very comfortable, neutral starting point that allows us to rotate up or down as needed in order to make things easy to play. By the way, if you combine the pitch rotation of your hand from the wrist with the drawbridge rotation in your forearm and the rotations in your upper arm, an amazing thing becomes possible. And it works like this. As your hand pitches up from the wrist, your forearm drawbridge moves down from the elbow. And vice versa, as your hand pitches down from the wrist, the drawbridge from your elbow rotates up. And so if you combine these motions, you see how you get this alternating motion? And by the way, don't constrain your shoulder, right? This is not done from a rigid elbow, but from a free and liberated upper arm. But anyway, let's put this together now and see what happens, right? So at first I'm gonna do this in slow motion. And you might try this with me just to get that feeling in your muscles. But watch what happens as I speed this up. And what happens is it feels like I'm nearly doing nothing else but flopping my hand around back and forth quite naturally. And what this allows me to do, this allows me to play repeatedly up and down with incredible speed in total balance and with almost no effort whatsoever. And by the way, this is not a camera trick. Experiment number four. Let's take a closer look at the yaw rotation of your hand from the wrist. And notice that when you make a fist or extend your fingers flat, that this motion feels quite difficult. But that when you simply allow your fingers to assume their natural curved shape, this motion feels quite free and easy. Experiment number five. Let's take another look at the yaw rotation of your hand from the wrist, allowing your fingers to be naturally curved. Just kind of playfully move them around. And let's rotate our hand toward our thumb and take it to an extreme and try to move your fingers around and notice how difficult that feels. And now rotate your hand towards your pinky. And again, try to move your fingers around and notice that this feels quite difficult. Now just playfully move your hand around between these two extremes. And notice that the most comfortable orientation of your hand with respect to your arm is such that if you draw a straight line along the axis of your forearm, it does not go straight through your middle finger like this, but rather somewhere through the big knuckle of your index finger. And as always, this is not some fixed and rigid position, right? But just a very comfortable, neutral position that allows us to rotate in both directions as needed in order to make things easy to 
play. Experiment number six. Notice that your hands are capable of a third and very subtle motion. And it's like the opening and the closing of a flower. Open, close, open, close. Which, by the way, is intimately related to how your fingers move. And it's something we are going to explore in more detail in the next section. Now let's explore how your fingers work. And let's begin by noticing how each finger is unique in at least eight different ways. Notice that your fingers come in different lengths different strengths, different speeds, different amounts of dexterity, different amounts of independence from each other, different ranges of motions, different locations with respect to your hand, and a different amount of reach when extended away from your body. Also notice that your thumb is in a specially special case, not quite like the other four fingers. In fact, I can think of at least six things that make your thumb special. First, your thumbs are way, way stronger than your other four fingers. Second, while your other four fingers are connected to your hand at the top of your palm, your thumb is actually connected to your hand very near your wrist. Third, your thumb does not extend nearly as far away from your body as the other four fingers. Fourth, your thumb is capable of moving extremely, and I mean extremely independently, from the other four fingers. Fifth, there's a huge amount of reach between your thumb and all of the four other fingers, including your index finger. In fact, a lot more reach than there is between any other two adjacent fingers. And sixth, the orientation of your thumb is almost perpendicular to your other four fingers, as you can see by which direction your fingernails are pointed. All that said, it is a huge mistake to think that you can, by physical training, make your fingers equal. And so, for example, no matter how hard you might try to change them, your pinkies will never, ever be as strong as your thumbs. For example, no matter how hard you might try to change them, your ring fingers will never be as independent as your index fingers. For example, no matter how hard you might try to change them, your ring fingers and pinkies will never ever be as fast as your index and middle fingers. For example, no matter how hard you might try to change them, your thumb will never reach as far away from you as your middle fingers. In summary, each of your fingers has a unique set of capabilities and limitations, which are for all practical purposes anatomically unalterable. But it is extremely important to, to be aware of these differences because they have a huge influence on when and how you use your fingers, especially, especially your thumbs when you play. 
Now that we've learned a little bit about the very natural differences between each finger, let's take a more detailed look at how our fingers move by doing several experiments. Experiment number one. Even though we talk about your hands and fingers as separate body parts, notice that as you expand and contract your hands, Your fingers do not behave like separate and independent body parts, but behave more like extensions of your hand. Let's take a closer look. So specifically, as you open your hand, in other words, as you flatten your palm, three things happen. Your fingers naturally lift up your fingers naturally flatten out and your fingers naturally spread out. And as you close your hand, your fingers naturally drop back down. Your fingers naturally curve back inward and your fingers naturally move closer together. Also notice that somewhere between actively opening your hand and actively closing your hand, there's a happy place in between where you do not have to try to do anything at all. And in this happy place, notice that your pinky, ring finger, middle finger, and index finger are naturally curved and that your thumb just kind of lays there, right? Anyway, this is the free and easy starting point we want to add to our overall playing posture. And how we get there by simply allowing our hands and fingers to assume their natural shapes without trying to do anything. Experiment number two. Let's make sure that when we open our hands, that we simply allow our fingers to go along for the ride. Without, this is really important, without trying to force them to do anything uncomfortable. In other words, we want to avoid doing things like forming a rigid claw or forcibly extending our fingers like we're shooting lightning bolts out of our fingertips. Right? So notice that both of these extremes, the, the rigid claw and the hyperextension of our fingers like shooting lightning bolts, you know, both severely constrain our finger motions and cause enormous amounts of tension. And so the lesson here is this. As you open your hand, all you need to do is do so gently while allowing your fingers to go along for the ride. Experiment number three. Once again, let's assume our agile, ready to play posture using everything we've learned so far. And let's allow our pinky, ring, middle, index fingers to assume their natural curvature. And let's just let our thumb lay there, right? Let's call it a lazy thumb. And let's explore how these five fingers move independently of each other and independently of our hands in the vertical direction. So starting with your thumb, let's rotate each finger vertically from the big knuckle of each finger one at a time first moving down from our neutral starting position then lifting up from our neutral starting position and notice that moving your thumb up and down is quite easy, but that the other four fingers are another story. 
Right, notice that moving your index, middle, ring, and pinky fingers downward from their neutral starting position is not that hard at all. But that lifting your fingers up from their neutral position is much more difficult. And by the way, especially difficult, yikes, especially difficult for your ring finger. Experiment number four. Once again, let's assume our agile, ready to play posture using everything we've learned so far. And let's explore how our fingers move independently of each other and independently of our hands in the lateral or horizontal or left and right direction. So starting with your thumb, let's move each finger laterally one at a time. And by the way, this, this motion is a rotation from the big knuckles of each finger. All right, and as we do this, notice that rotating your thumb left and right is quite easy. And it has an enormous range of motion, but that the other four fingers are not so easy to rotate left and right. And also that their the range of motion is quite limited. You know, and although, although not so difficult and not so limited for your index finger and your pinky. Experiment number five. Let's intentionally flick our thumbs down. And notice that at least one and maybe two undesirable things happen. First, that tension immediately comes to your hand and other four fingers. And second, that your other four fingers might want to flick up in the opposite direction. When, <laughs> this is important, when you don't want them to, right? And so I mention this because this thumb flicking motion is a very common technical mistake that we want to eliminate from our playing. Little sneak peek at future lessons. How do we eliminate it? By replacing the flicking motion with a controlled arm rotation and a controlled dropping of our arms into the keys. Experiment number six. Let's assume our agile, ready to play posture using everything we've learned so far. And let's wiggle our fingers around. And let's notice what happens to our other four fingers as we intentionally pull our thumb or tuck our thumb under our palm. And notice how your hand and all your other four fingers cramp up immediately. Now I mention this because forcibly tucking your thumb or pulling your thumb under your palm is a huge source of tension that we want to eliminate from our playing. How? Well, the answer is a universal. It's by allowing all your other piano playing body parts and motions to come to the rescue. And this is a hugely important principle that has the power to eliminate unnecessary tension and liberate all of our playing. Now that we've explored the natural postures, and motions of each one of our piano playing body parts, and also some of the common ways that we can get into trouble by not using them properly. Let's put it all together to see how it feels to play with a coordinated full body technique. So let's continue by assembling this posture using everything we've learned in this video. Right? 
balanced but flexible head and torso. You know, make sure our buns don't get welded to the bench, by the way. Relaxed shoulders, just let them go. Upper arms that are neither unnat unnaturally lifted nor welded to our sides. Forearms that are slightly rotated towards our pinkies. Hands that are naturally angled outward a little bit, such that the axis of our forearms kind of goes through the first knuckle of our index finger. Then pinky, ring, middle, and index fingers that are naturally curved. And a thumb that just kind of lays there. And as always, realizing that this posture is never static and fixed and rigid, right? But it's something that's alive and flowing and always ready for action. Before continuing, I suggest that we give this comfortable, natural, agile, ready-to-play posture a name. And I'm thinking something short and sweet, gender non-specific, and it's something we can refer to, use as a cue, C-U-E-Q for future reference. And I thought, well, how about Pat, P-A-T, Pat. But by the way, I thought about using Frank, but then I thought, well, that might be a bit self-indulgent and even just a teeny bit unintentionally sexist. So let's run with Pat. And by the way, you can call it anything you want for your own purposes, but for our purposes in order to, communi yeah, to communicate with each other, let's call it Pat. And when I say Pat, what am I talking about? I'm talking about this. Right? So let's practice doing pat. Ready? One, two, three, pat. One, two, three, pat. Got it? Once again, let's go ahead and find pat. Pat. Right? And first of all, notice that we can assemble pat in just a matter of a heartbeat. Right? A single heartbeat. Ready? One, two, three, pat. And then let's get some imaginary music going, something fun. And let's move left and right and up and down and forward and back. And let's rotate freely about all three axes and all three dimensions. Let's sometimes let's play in parallel motion, sometimes in contrary motion. Let's do some skips, maybe some reversals. Right? Some scale looking stuff, some arpeggio looking stuff. Right? And just have just have fun with this. And let's now talk about all the good things that happen if we're doing this the right way. And if we're doing this the right way, each and every one of our piano playing body parts should be always moving left and right and up and down and forward and back in waves and arcs and curves in all three dimensions. And if we're doing this the right way, we're never jerking. But we are always preparing and anticipating and carrying a momentum from one musical place to the next. And if we're doing this the right way, we should feel a strong sense of unity and connectedness and teamwork, teamwork between all our piano playing body parts. And if you're doing this the right way, allowing all, all of your piano playing body parts to contribute freely. It should feel like your head and torso 
and shoulders and upper arms and forearms and hands and fingers are floating. And by the way, if you do this the right way, a remarkable thing happens. Even your legs and your feet will feel like they're floating as well. And if you're doing this the right way, you will profoundly understand that a musical piano technique is not based on individual finger gymnastics, but is based on coordinating all our piano playing body parts in such a way that it makes it easy for our fingers to play. And if we do this the right way, we automatically stress, automatically eliminate so many causes of unconscious tension and awkwardness and unnecessary emotion and fatigue and wasted effort before we even make our first contact with the keys. And if we are doing this the right way, a wide variety of natural, easy to play, full body gestures becomes possible. Allowing us to play any musical pattern with freedom and ease. And so, in a nutshell, the development of your piano technique becomes a matter of discovering and practicing the gestures that are appropriate to executing the musical patterns that you are playing. And then choreographing a series of these gestures in such a way that it allows you to fluently express your musical intentions. One, two, three, four.